Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the fourth episode of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition's 2021 webinar series. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Michael Yellowbird um, as, as, our, as our webinar guest today. He is um, uh, an incredible scholar, a great thinker, all around awesome human being, and also a NAPS board member. So we're blessed to have him today. Um, before we move forward, I just wanted to invite everyone, if this is your first webinar or if you've been with us previously, we invite you to check out boardingschoolhealing.org slash events, uh, where we have uh, webinar recordings accessible, available to you. Uh, there are YouTube links there on the page. We also want to um, encourage you to check out, if you're going to choose just one, we of course invite you to to view all of them, there's a lot of great educational resources and, and, and really excellent information um, in, a, in, in, in large variety and broad scopes. Um, but if you're going to choose just one, our most recent one, episode three, um, we, we, we had Heather Whiteman runs him, uh, formerly attorney uh, at, at NARF and who was instrumental in presenting the UN, a UN filing uh, on missing children. We had Marsha Small who is um, in the process of and has experienced conducting ground, pen ground penetrating radar and magnetometry um, in, uh, in, in, in historical Indian boarding school cemeteries searching for unmarked graves. And uh, with Lauren Peters, who described the process and protocols that she has been following to um, uh, repatriate the remains of, of her great aunt currently uh, uh, buried at, at the Carlisle uh, Barracks Post Cemetery. Um, so I want to begin real, real quick by uh, uh, inviting you to, um, to, to join the coalition. We'll provide some links with you if you're not already a member. Um, our vision, of course, is Indigenous cultural sovereignty, our mission to lead in the pursuit of understanding and addressing the ongoing trauma created by the U.S. Indian boarding school policy. Before we introduce uh, Dr. Michael Yellowbird, um, I'd like to go ahead and, and, and introduce myself real quick and, and um, offer uh, in, the, in the right cultural policy uh, protocol and way. Donalte no yolikni nanotoka samo torres. Good afternoon and evening, wherever you may be. My name is Sam Torres. I'm the director of research and programs for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Um, and uh, with us today is Dr. Michael Yellowbird. Michael Yellowbird is Dean and Professor of the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba. He's an enrolled member of the MHA Nation in North Dakota. He has held faculty and, admi and administrative appointments at the University of British Columbia, University of Kansas, Arizona State University, Humboldt State University, and North Dakota State University. His research focuses on the effects of colonization and methods of decolonization, ancestral health, intermittent fasting, indigenous mindfulness, neurodecolonization, mindful decolonization, and the cultural significance of res dogs. He is the founder, director, and principal investigator of the Center for Mindful Decolonization and Reconciliation at the University of Manitoba. He serves as a consultant, trainer, and senior advisor to several BIPOC mindfulness groups and organizations who are seeking to incorporate mindfulness practices, philosophies, and activities to indigenize and decolonize Western mindfulness approaches in order to address systemic racism and engage in structural change. He's the author of numerous scholarly articles, book chapters, research reports, and the co-editor of four books for Indigenous Eyes Only, The Decolonization Handbook, for Indigenous Minds Only, a, decoloniz a Decolonization Handbook, Indigenous Social Work Around the World Towards Culturally Relevant Education and Practice, and Decolonizing Social Work. <clears throat> Choice Magazine selected Decolonizing Social Work as a 2014 Choice Outstanding Academic Title. Choice Outstanding Titles are given extraordinary recognition by the academic community and are, and are designated to be the best of the best. He's the co-author of two recent books, Asanish Ethnobotany, and Decolonizing Holistic Pathways Towards Integrative Healing and Social Work. His most recent co-authored mindfulness article, Defunding Mindfulness, While We Sit on Our Cushions, Systemic Racism Runs Rampant, can be found online. We're very grateful to have Dr. Yellowbird today. 
And it is one of our intentions to be able to uh, create a sense of balance and harmony in the webinar offerings that, that we have lately. Um, we are extremely happy and blessed to have Dr. Yellowbird discuss healing through uh, mindfulness and, 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 de and neuro decolonization uh, today, especially in light with recent news coming out of, um, of British Columbia and Saskatchewan um, regarding um, recent findings of uh, uh, burials of children in unmarked graves. Um, as we know, this has taken a toll on a lot of us. And um, as, as uh, advocates of uh, increasing awareness, increasing advocacy, and, uh, and promoting community-led healing, we know that we must be able to walk on the path towards healing oneself so that we can also support one another. So in that way, we're so grateful to have you, Dr. Yellowbird. And uh, with that, we look forward to, uh, to hearing your words today. So Kamati, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Samuel. Um, thanks for the uh, great introduction. I, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to um, have, a, have a discussion with everyone and to kind of share uh, what my research is all about and how I think that um, what I'm gonna share, I think will not be unfamiliar to many people, but also to share, I think some things that may be unfamiliar to most of us in terms of how we integrate, uh, how I integrate uh, Western science along with indigenous science and knowledge to come up with this high, hybrid of, of uh, healing. I think that's very important. So um, I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time um, talking, um, but just get right into my presentation, but just to acknowledge the land that I'm on right now, I'm in Treaty One territory in uh, Manitoba. And this is the uh, traditional lands of the Dakota, the uh, Cree, OJ Cree, the uh, Anishinaabe and uh, Dene people, and also the uh, homelands of the Métis people. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. And, um, and uh, as, as Sam was saying that, um, you know, we've been grappling with a lot of this uh, after effects or fallout from uh, the, uh, the uh, finding of these uh, missing children. And uh, more, is, uh, more um, discoveries like this or findings are, are Almost inevitable is what what most people say. So we've been dealing a lot with the uh, a lot of grief and a lot of uh, sadness and of course a lot of anger and frustration. Um, so um, with that in mind, you know um, I hope hope everyone is uh, well, everyone is safe, and I hope you know um, if you're attending um, to this to this, you know that you may find this or this uh, presentation you may you find it helpful. So I'm going to jump right into my presentation uh, and show my screen at this point. And um, hopefully you can see that. Let me just um, close this up here. Okay. So um, this pr particular um, presentation I, I've done before, I add and uh, things to it, and I, I take things out to try to make it uh, appropriate, but as full as I can to kind of bring uh, some interesting, I think, findings and some interesting research together. Um, this is my oldest daughter, uh, Arundhati, who is uh, sitting behind our house when we lived in Fargo in, in uh, North Dakota and meditating. And she's been meditating for many, many years, um, ever since she was a little girl. She's now um, uh, 13 years old, or 14 years old, I'm sorry, and um, still meditates, and her little sisters meditate as well. Uh, why do they meditate? Well, um, meditation, part of contemplative practices, are one of the things that we've always done as indigenous people, you know, to do this deep reflection. To, to calm our minds, to focus our minds on something sacred or something that's meaningful, or just to focus on, you know, our body, our breath, or the ceremony, or, you know, what, our song, or whatever it is. And we know now from a lot of research that's been conducted, you know, it's kind of caught up to the indigenous science, is that you know, really dynamic things happen in, in the brain and the body all the way down to the molecular system. So I'm going to just start with that introduction and talk a little bit about what, what I mean when I say decolonizing the mind and cleansing the body and what neurodecolonization is all about. Well, I, I'm, I'm really interested in how the experiences and perceptions of trauma change our brain structure and function, and, and also how the environment triggers or silences our genetic expression, activates different brain regions, and even changes our, our brain waves and, and shapes uh, these specialized uh, brain cells such as mirror neurons that we help that are important for us to develop a sense of compassion and understanding of others. 
but also alters neurotransmitters. I'll talk a little bit about that this evening and modulators. So like, what do they do in the brain? And I think they're, it's, they're very important because it tells us a little bit about um, who we are and what we were as cultures and how uh, our neurotransmitters worked in our brain with the messaging and also the modulators, how they brought information in and how they um, you know, uh, allowed for this expansion of uh, interesting, diverse ideas to come in. And, and if we don't do that today, of course, uh, you know, there, are, there are issues and problems with uh, our ability to kind of understand diverse situations and, and, uh, and uh, people and, and that sort of thing. I only say that because modulators also probably are, were very open in the past to um, um, brain modulators or neuro uh, modulators. In the fact that you know people actually you know um, had relationships you know with with all of creation right with the stars with the sky with the lands with the waters with the, those beings that fly those beings that move you know four legged and those that swim it's really interesting because we talk a lot about that but what it really is important to understand is that you know that modulation in the brain has to work in order to for, to be open to to experience that kind of relationship. Uh, the last uh, one here, is, I'm not going to talk hardly much about it at all, but it's a process because it it's a very long um, training actually uh, that I do with this, uh, all of these uh, areas, but the, our gut biome, what we eat, you know, traditional foods um, um, are, are very, very important for our, our health and colonizing or decolonizing our, our body and cleansing our, our minds and so on. So I, I want to talk tonight about uh, these up, updated quadrants of, of the medicine wheel that I've, uh, I've um, Try to pull together to help us um, uh, decolonize ourselves and uh, guide us towards our personal community, social justice, and health and healing. Um, also, a bit about in, uh, indigenous ancestors and, and why they were correct in their worldviews and how were they correct. I'll talk about that uh, in which they lived and how they practiced healing and so on, including how living, living like a Westerner is hazardous to our health. We know that. Uh, I'll share some terms in neuroscience, uh, or not too many in microbial science. But more in the genetic sciences and uh, and also um, um, in, in, in other areas too, like sleep science and movement science. I'll talk a bit about tonight. Um, I, I also want to talk a little bit about how current science and traditional knowledge um, regarding uh, trauma and cognitive resilience um, come together, and what are the implications for healing from colonization and trauma. I, I would I would just say that we are not the same as our ancestors. Our ancestors probably didn't suffer as long as we did from trauma that we do today from trauma and there are reasons for that and you'll see that once we get to some slides called um, um, you know uh, cognitive resilience that's happening in the brain and some of the things I talk about um, also uh, a little bit about neuroscience and contemplative practices uh, adaptive stress and the last uh, part of if we'll get a chance hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about genetic variants and epigenetic variants and, and what do they do for us, you know, um, if, if we help them express properly or if we silence them with the, the way they need to be silenced or if they're activated because of stress, because of trauma, those kinds of things. So we, we really do have a choice here in, in whether or not, you know, um, our epigenetic uh, circumstances are going to work for us or work against us. And um, I'll, I'll move on from that, but just, just remember that we do have a choice and, and being um, in trauma for a long periods of time. Uh, sometimes, of course, short circuit, you know, um, uh, our wellness. And um, so let me just start with this uh, neuro decolonization. Uh, um, the idea of it is to engage in these evolutionary mind body practices, you know, um, that you'll see that help decolonize and liberate the brain and body from the effects of colonization and trauma. There's a, there's a number of things that we live with today that are incongruent to our, to our, to our, uh, to our minds and our bodies. We have damaging beliefs, values, memories, uh, lifestyles that we live, uh, and, all, and you know, all the way down to relationships. And so decolonization in, in this particular context is any kind of meaningful or active resistance to the forces of colonialism that perpetuate the subjugation and the, the exploitation of our minds, bodies, and lands. So that's that's what we're we're really focusing on now is how do we decolonize from these different forces that are subjugating us, right? Where we carry these memories around, memories around. and, and let, let me say this too: like trauma, um, I'll get to it at towards the end. But trauma really is not one size fits all. Some of you out there listening are, you know, what they now in the literature they call dandelion kids. 
or dandelion people. And you know, the dandelion is how tough that is. It comes back every year. It doesn't matter if you, you know, spray, you know, weed killer on there or you dig it up or you even napalm it or, you know, whatever, it's going to come back. And so, you know, there are people that exist, you know, in, in our societies throughout human history that have particular genetic variants that, um, that you know, create um, a much greater uh, sense of resilience, cognitive and, um, and um, um, as well as uh, physiological re resilience, right? So it's not one size fits all. So it's, it's um, sometimes it's genetic, where some, some people are genetically gifted sometimes and other people may end up with, with different kinds of uh, genetic profiles where that make them more vulnerable. These are the people that now are known in the, in the literature as uh, orchid children, right? Or where if I come from uh, out in the Great Plains, I'll say, you know, the wild roses, you know, they don't, they, all you need is to get cold a little bit and then a little bit of freezing and then they, you know, they wilt and they die. And we, we see that with human beings too as well, levels of sensitivity. Anyway, I'm gonna get too carried around, away with that, but I just kind of want you to remember that. So the ultimate purpose of decolonization, of course, is to overturn the colonial structure and realize liberation in our minds and our bodies. But I always say that first and foremost, decolonization must occur in our minds, right? We can talk about it all day. We can try to start language programs. We can start culture programs. We can start traditional healing and, and those kinds of things. But unless we engage the mind in this active process and silence it enough and create the space for it in, in, our, uh, in our neural networks, it's very difficult. Healing is very difficult because it's not just the brain. As I said, it gets all the way down to molecular structures. Um, and so, you know, we, we can't pretend that we're healing because the body, you know, is, is uh, you know, as they say, keeps score of what's going on. Right? So I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, this holistic system, how our brains and our genes and the microbes and all these cellular molecular systems, lifestyles we live, all, everything, um, um, you know, is shaped by the relationship we had with our environment. And uh, that's very clear then when we start looking at medicine wheels, um, where the symbol of harmony, balance, and peaceful interaction among all living beings on earth. They represent, of course, everyone, I think probably everyone out, out there in the, uh, in the audience or, uh, knows that you know, they relate to birth, life, death, and rebirth, right? Among many tribes, there are cardinal directions or semi-cardinal directions. And each direction has its own teachings and representation, uh, representative of all forms of life. We know that, but it, what's been interesting is that, you know, uh, it's incorporated to all these other elements, air, water, fire, earth, and connecting points from Mother Earth and Father Sky, and a final point, the center, representing the human being. So it, we, we talk about that a lot, but I'm really interested in what that looks like in the medicine wheel in Turtle Island. So really the first place that, you know, um, was a reference point for a lot of folks is in the Bighorn Mountains in, in Wyoming, this uh, medicine wheel, which is, about 10,000 years old, I think it's been dated to be 10,000 years old. So if you can imagine being there and you're, you're, let's say you're a drone or you're, you know, in a, in a helicopter or a plane passing by, this is what it would look like, you know, from uh, above. And this is a dated picture. But again, think about it, 10,000 years ago where all these tribal people were coming from all different parts, all the quarters of the universe. And at some point, you know, they were camping. And you know all you know all in these different places here. If you can see my, let me see if I can get my uh, laser pointer working. They're all in these areas here, right? And this here is the cliff where they, you know, I think, it's where the eagles sing or whatever. But just um, if you can see that, you know, people coming here, and that's kind of one of the things where that we see that you know there are these crossroads, these sacred sites, these holy places throughout the world where there's a convergence of, of uh, a moral convergence of and a spiritual convergence of people. So we, we, we still, we saw that back then, you know, because of that place has been excavated a bit and we know there's been a lot of activity. If we come up to the here and now, we see that people are still coming out to that place, you know, and leaving things like dream catchers or prayer offerings and also, um, you know, tobacco ties and uh, sacred colors. And it's kind of roped off now, um, that place. <clears throat> and it really, to me, reminds me, when I talk about mindfulness, it reminds me that how important color is to people. Here we see Buddhist prayer flags that essentially kind of are the same thing to send prayers out, you know, to the rest of the world, which is done, you know, um, at, at Sundance as well. So if you, you see a Sundance, if you've been to a Sundance, you'll see these uh, flags that, you know, people tie, and, you know, uh, with tobacco and they put their prayers in there to pray for everyone, right? And um, 
and and you know uh, people are in this circle like the medicine wheel and you've got these four places that come in um, maybe somebody on the call is from you know I attended Haskell Indian Nations University I was a professor down uh, at uh, the University of Kansas so Haskell was just down the road so I used to go over to Haskell quite a bit and um, um, talk to students, lecture with students. I used to run sweat lodges for uh, young men over there. And uh, every now and then, we, uh, you know, before the days of all this high stakes gambling and all the uh, laptops and stuff, we used to take a, a car of, of young guys and we all uh, go up to uh, up to the Potawatomi Reservation and go gamble and just hang out, play cards and bingo and stuff. But it was it was uh, these were uh, people that were that you know were really interested in that. And so this whole medicine wheel you know came about. The planning of students, and of course, it's been you know uh, up uh, there. It's been there's upkeep around there. So if you look at that, you see the people sort of moving into the place here, into the center, and of course, either uh, praying or uh, making offerings, and uh, more people over on this side, of course, or um, you know just um, you know just visiting it for some contemplative time. Um, a few years ago, I was invited down to Callaway, North Carolina, uh, uh, Eastern Cherokee country. Uh, by some of the uh, social workers and the elders, and I, I had a chance to uh, go out to this rock, this ancient rock, with uh, a lot of the um, elders wanted me to go out and see the rocks. I went out with them, and, and uh, they ex described it to me and explained, you know, what it is. You can't really see it from here, but when you look at the rock, you know, see all kinds of markings on there, which, when you get up close, look like this. So we know that this rock is, um, or this stone, or this sacred site is about 3,000 years old, right? During what they call the late archaic period, which Western science calls it. So if, if you look at what symbols are, are in this, you know, you, you, what do you see? I mean, the, the one that always gets me is this is this being or this uh, here with, you know, the uh, suction cups on the head, right? And of course, moving up some kind of, um, 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 you know, path, you know, and these are like, you know, places to stop and you've got holding hands with this child or whoever this is. Moving down, you know, the same, the same path, or maybe this is uh, attachment to the head or whatever. But moving along this path, in encountering different kinds of um, things, that's an animal. If this is a place here where, they're, you know, and they, and they see things as they go along, up, up, you know, all these things. And what I was told by these these elders and, and folks that have studied this rock is that these are not just from the Cherokee. The Cherokee are probably weren't even the Cherokee at that time. They probably call themselves something completely different. But what we know now is that these um, uh, carvings uh, and these uh, imprints in, this, uh, in the stone uh, come from a number of different tribes that were converging in that part of the uh, uh, Turtle Island, you know, on the uh, eastern seaboard. And as you look, as you look and see all these really interesting things, you think, well, how did? I mean, I do. How did these people come up with this like butterfly person, right, moving along, or these other things that could look like COVID, you know, 19, you know, the, uh, with the uh, with the crowns on and stuff, and and people on these paths and you know whatever these things are you know um, and, and then of course when you look all over to this side here what do you see well a lot of people say well we see um we see um a turtle and they say it's a turtle so if it you know it really is a turtle it's you know at least people have been referring to the land we are on as turtle island for at least three thousand years um, and of course you see within the turtle or on top of the turtle or part of the turtle the medicine wheel Right. Now, I don't know uh, um, if anyone does uh, have an, an understanding of why those dots are in there. Anyway, I'm just so fascinated by that, where uh, how rich and how vibrant and how creative and how as existential, you know, the lives of, of people were. They're just like, you know, beyond from where they were. You know, there was there was sort of out there right, at some some point. So on my reservation, three affiliate tribes, you see there's a medicine wheel and there, there are more medicine wheels, right? If we go down to the desert, we see the medicine wheel there and these uh, uh, rock pictographs or uh, hieroglyphics. And uh, even at this one here, some people say, well, it looks like a whale with a medicine wheel there. Um, so there's a long history. I don't have all the slides I have in there. I took a, a bunch out because I only have a very limited time. So what I, what I was doing is thinking about that, you know, how old that symbol is and what it incorporates, the creativity, the experience and the diversity of, of indigenous people coming together. And what I did is I said, well, let me, let me take a look at the, the mind, the body, the spirit, 
and the emotions in terms of what's happening in the brain, in terms of things like neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change its shape and function, um, uh, given uh, when you, uh, it, it takes on new tasks, right? Or you new, learn a new language, or you uh, start reading uh, more, or you start playing an instrument or singing songs, or even when you pray and change your prayers, or you start running, the, the, the brain starts changing in its shape and function. Also, neurogenesis, the idea that your brain can continually grow more and more um, brain cells, um, and there's different ways that happen. And I think you'll be interested to see how that happened, I think, with people in the past, how that, how that came about. The human microbiome in the body, besides just uh, everything else, I think is a really important area, but we won't have enough time to talk about that. I will, do, I will talk about some of the spiritual aspects of uh, indigenous contemplative practices, and uh, hopefully we have enough time to talk a bit about um, genetic inheritance and epigenetics and telomeres and other molecular structures that are tied into the emotions that are, of course, tied into uh, trauma. So, uh, you know, we have this medicine wheel and what I say here is our culture, our experiences, and perceptions, all these things that, you know, that we experience and we perceive in our culture uh, affect the way our brain is shaped. It affects us all the way down to the molecular level and even to our neurotransmitters and modulators. Um, we also know that now, after looking at the research for a while, I'm thinking, wow, how do we heal from diseases of colonization? How do we insulate ourselves from the diseases of colonization, right? Um, despite, you know, the trauma that continues to happen, how do we make a more resilient person, right? Well, all of these things, I think, plasticity of the brain, the human microbiome, the, you know, which is also... Um, as plasticity because the, the, the bacteria in our gut change all the time based upon our stress, based upon how we sleep, based upon the foods we eat, based upon if we fast or exercise, those kinds of things. They, the system all works together. And our genetic inheritance, right, can change too because we can, we can get uh, genes from our mothers or fathers or we can get genes, epigenetic genes from some generations ago that, you know, are going to be there to uh, spur on something like historical trauma we are not at the mercy of our genes or we're not at the mercy of trauma. What I'm saying is that once we begin to return to a traditional um, form of, of, of uh, lifestyle, like movement, sleep, laughter, all of these things that I've posted here, have a lot of really, really good historical evidence as well as uh, Western uh, science evidence base. We, we, of course, we have to understand colonization before we get into the whole, um, discussion on uh, what, what these factors are. You know, uh, colonization essentially has been happening to us all the time, long before um, Europeans came here, or long before, you know, uh, um, white folks or any of that kind of thing. Colonization has been happening. You know, um, different parasites have colonized our body long before we even had contact with any other groups. Um, sometimes, um, um, you know, the microbiome of one group of indigenous people who met another group of indigenous people, if they shared food and utensils or uh, you know they exchange genetic material and you know uh, even if they kissed or shook hands sometimes you can have um, you know a change of, 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 uh, um, of a bacteria or a virus or or um, fungus you know that can happen and, and for some the, the invasion is not so big and the contamination is not so harmful for other uh, situations uh, uh, an invasion or, or the the um, unwelcome intrusion or the passing of some um, material to you can be very, very harmful. Uh, if it is, you know, uh, generally what happens is we get overwhelmed in our immunity to respond to that because we may or may not have the immune uh, system to respond to, um, you know, the parasites or, or the body uh, or the, uh, the body burden that we get from viruses or fungus. That's pretty clear that when we look at um, people, no matter who they are, uh, some of us wouldn't survive very long down in the uh, in the rainforest with uh, uh, some of the uh, Chimene Indians who uh, walk around and have a heavy, heavy, heavy parasite load. Our our ancestors definitely had a very heavy parasite load back in the day, and uh, all not all parasites are bad. Sometimes parasites, uh, if you're infected with them, can actually strengthen the immunity. What's happened though in in the present world is that. Uh, um, with Western science believing that all parasites are bad, you know, uh, those things were wiped out and, and um, to our detriment, right? They're part of the great circle of life, you know, and I could talk about that, but I won't, I'll move to colonization then. 
So if you are a person or if you're a society that, you know, uh, uh, has these three first uh, pieces in colonization, you know, you either at the infection level, you either uh, get very sick or you die, just like in COVID-19, right? So if we say diabetes, you know, like sugar or refined products or whatever was the unwelcome intrusion or, or um, COVID-19 was, and for a lot of people, it's toxic, it's harmful, right? Uh, the, um, the the carbohydrate sugar load of of, uh, of refined carbohydrates can be very very toxic to some people who have a high carbohydrate sensitivity, and quickly you know can release all kinds of, um, uh, of um, insulin to the body to try to deal with you know the high levels of, of toxic sugar. Same thing with uh, COVID-19. Um, you know uh, when people get contaminated by the disease, they have what they call a cytokine storm, and the body just overreacts to um, to the uh, contamination and actually kills some people. So if we if we continue around the horn here, that's what happens. You know when the infection rate sets, sets in. Um, so those people who survive the first three uh, phases of the colonization actually are the ones that do become colonized. They are no longer overwhelmed by uh, whatever's kind of uh, um, invaded their body or their minds or their belief system. Right? If we use diabetes and say that. You know, um, the invasion was, uh, you know, with certain kinds of food that created high levels of, of glucose uh, in the body, and they were content, and it was harmful, and it began to affect their pancreas, and we got, um, you know, um, insulin resistance. So we, we're at this point where we get very sick. So then we, instead of changing uh, our diet or exercising, we instead um, take um, uh, insulin, or we're given insulin. And so that's really the true colonization because the diabetes lives in the body. Then, the, then you're very colonized. You, you no longer are going to die right away. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the, the, the sugar or, or the food has colonized your body and the microbes. So um, that's how that works. And we can use many examples. COVID-19, as I was saying. So what happens then to us then when we want to, uh, to overcome that, like I said, to... Um, to uh, liberate our bodies from that. Well, the first thing is a cleansing period and understanding that, yeah, we are sick. We've gotten very sick. And that's why we may be more sensitive to death um, um, and not as, as, not as um, uh, res resilient as, um, as our um, ancestors were, you know. Not that we shouldn't be, you know, uh, sensitive to death or sensitive to trauma, those kinds of things. But as, as we go along, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what did they do to kind of protect themselves about high levels of infant mortality and high levels of, of death that they experienced, right? They didn't live that long um, back in the day, and there were a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, threats to, to their well-being. So if we get into the cleansing period for us now, though, we have to look at, you know, what's been harmful and invasive that needs to be stripped away that's been imposed by these colonizing invasions, right? When we, when we begin to do that, we move into a period of, of renaissance, which is how do we restore cultural practices and beliefs and lifestyles that, were, that are important to us, right? And they're still relevant and necessary for, for soul and well-being. And so I'll talk about what some of those are. And the enlightenment period is how do you bring, you know, and give birth to new ideas about this, right? This is what we've always done as indigenous people and human beings have always done this. They've always had new ideas, new thinking technology. So when we say traditional, we have to be very careful about the use of that word because traditional then can lead one to think that you become a very static culture. And no static culture um, that I've seen in history um, is going to survive. Every culture, no matter who it is, has to incorporate new ideas, thinking technologies that help you know, advance the, the culture, right? happened with a lot of Plains tribes where I'm from. Trading of material, of, of uh, the trading of, of ideas, their trading of, of uh, religion and spirituality, a number of different kinds of things, right? Ceremony, those kinds of things. Um, so it's interesting to, to, to see decolonization in that, in that way. Uh, let, me, let me move past this here and kind of get into um, really what neurodecolonization and neurogenesis and neuroplasticity are all about. Well, neurodecolonization is how do we bring together mindfulness approaches with traditional and contemporary contemplative practices to re-sculpt our brains, the neural pathways, right? That, that actually um, are a signal and they activate, you know, according to negative patterns of thought, beliefs, and so on. And how do we sculpt new ones 
and new uh, um, that you know or behaviors that will bring about you know uh, more positive beliefs, emotions, and um, healthy new productive um, neural networks in the brain. Right. So, and that's part of what you know what we call neuroplasticity in, in the in the neurosciences. The changing of the brain can change at any time. So some of the examples are are these here. Um, on this side here, but well, let's get into those. So this part of the medicine wheel, as you saw, was the mind. So let's get into the mind a bit. So there are mindfulness uh, practices that can heal emotions, reset genetic expression, facilitate improved learning, and as well as you know heal trauma, right? Yeah, not besides emotion. So what are these? So there, you know, there are twelve, and and I say children are meant to move, but so are adults. So this is an old slide. I, I've I've had some other language in there, but running, dancing, and singing. Right. Oh, so, well, yeah, that's important. Yeah, it makes you feel good. But let's we'll take a look after this why that is. Sleep, how important sleep is, and also the idea of laughter and humor, collectivism, being together, uh, intermittent fasting or fasting, uh, meditation, as I've been calling mindfulness, adaptive stress. How do we challenge our body and put it into what they call a state of hormesis, where it's like being challenged, but not too much. You know, it's like it's like you take just a little bit of the poison. So this is just a kind of just an analogy, right? If you take a little bit of the, you know, the poison or whatever it is, or the little bit of whatever it is, uh, um, a bee sting in your leg, right? For example, uh, which some therapies do. Uh, sometimes when you when you do that, the body begins to adapt to that, and respond to that, it doesn't overreact, and then it can adapt to that, and sometimes it can help cure things like or uh, change things like uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, Parkinson's disease. We know that the body has this adaptive strep, strep mechanism, um, this adaptive stress mecha mechanism that it, that it can um, activate. And of course, being outside. So let's go. Um, I just mentioned the parasites before. So if you get a chance, uh, take a look at this. Um, take a look at this video uh, about uh, this. The Chimene Indians down in Bolivia. I was talking about how you know they're the healthiest hearts on earth. They also have the healthiest brains on earth. In, with people in in Western world, these Chimene Indians that live like our ancestors have 70% less shrinkage in their brains than we do in the industrial world, meaning that their likelihood of getting dementia or Alzheimer's is very, very low, even though they may have genetic um, predispositions or um, genetic um, variants that may make them vulnerable to that, right? So something else is going on that we know it's just because you have the genetics for a disease really doesn't mean anything. Really what it seems to be is that, you know, lifestyle. And in this particular case, it's, it's the guess is that parasites are something that keep the body um, in a state of adaptive stress, not too, that the body can't be too heavy with parasites, but just enough so that the immune system is functioning well and, and it's not overreacting and responding, okay? So what about the effects of movement, right? So movement science is so important because we live in a world uh, especially as indigenous people with a movement deficit disorder. We are so much closer to our ancestors in that movement. If, if we're not moving, we're going to get much sicker than, than um, other populations that, you know, didn't move as much as we do. We come from hunter-gatherer populations, uh, some of them from traditional horticultural uh, populations like my people, but that's only 5,000 years ago or less. We have been hunter-gatherers for long, for thousands and thousands of years. Now, in Europe and in, in Asia and some places where they've had farming that's been going on for 10 to 12,000 years and the mutations uh, in the genes have sort of kept up with that so people can drink milk and eat bread and don't have you know, gluten or lactose intolerance or uh, they don't, they're not gonna get diabetes if they sit around as much as we do. We can look at the profile now of many indigenous people and say, wow, we got all these FTO gene, FTO genes, right? And those are genes that actually uh, create an issue of us gaining weight more rapidly, right? They, some people, you know, neuroscientists joke about it and call it the fatty gene. Well, I've got some fatty genes, not too many. My mother had several of them, and I, I didn't get um, uh, as many passed down from her, but I got some of them. Um, but this is the reason is because we don't move as much as we used to. And the reason we have those FO FTO genes, those fatty genes, is because we would be the people who admit the more copies you had back in the day who are going to survive famine or starvation. 
That's why those genes got passed down. That's why you see people today, uh, uh, a disproportionate number of indigenous people with, with obesity. That is the reason, right? And the reason that it's very difficult to bring that obesity down is because we don't incorporate a traditional diet with high fiber, we don't intermittent fast, and we don't move like our ancestors used to move. We have what they call uh, ad libitum eating where we can go and snack anytime we want. Go to that fridge, we don't have to go out like this guy and chase down a jackrabbit. We, all we have to do is walk over to the store, even during the time of COVID, or we can put out an order, you know, and, and, and DoorDash will bring some, some food to you, right? So we, we evolved to move and run. We have the biology and physiology. And like I said, I'll say it again, we are so close to our ancestors that we're running and moving that if we're not running and moving, we're going to get sick, right? Persistence running is in our heritage, meaning that we run down our food, we go and hunt and gather, pick all the berries and dig up the roots, those kinds of things. That is in our DNA, that's in our genetic profile, right? There's just no way around that, right? Um, something like exercise is novel, you know, our ancestors never did exercise. To their lifestyle, everything they did was, you know, uh, movement and, and had to do with fitness. So what is running or movement doing? When I, when I say running, I don't mean to say that's all we do, but riding a bike, walking, uh, getting your heart rate up, or um, uh, um, dancing, anything, or swimming, any of those kinds of things that get your heart rate up, improves not only physical fitness, but also your mental health, improves the brain's working memory, our brain's processing speed, where I was talking about, you know, how, how we can, um, how we can um, um, you know, learn things quicker. And this is something we're suffering from now uh, in Western society, and suffering even more so in indigenous society, our, process, our brain's processing speed, because we're not out there hunting and gathering, processing, you know, where, where we're gonna get our food or stepping over rocks or ducking under branches. Our brain has to process continually throughout the day when, when we uh, don't know the terrain and we're moving. Now we don't do that. We sit there and we have a very, very uh, narrow routine where we don't uh, uh, work our brain's uh, working memory or its processing speed. Guess what? That leads to dementia, leads to a decline in the brain. Movement also improves the brain's executive function. And right below that, what is that? Well, it it's, gives us the ability to delay gratification. So, you know, we, I don't want, I, I need that right away. You know, I need food, I need this, that. So you delay gratification. That's a survival mechanism, right? Delaying gratification. So avoid distraction, staying focused, right? And improving cognitive flexibility, moving from one uh, cognitive or intellectual task or thinking task to the next one without you know, big, big issues or problems, right? That's a flexible brain. That was, is what was required of our ancestors to be very flexible in the foods they ate, the ceremonies they did, the interactions they had with other tribes, the, the interactions they had with their natural environment. You know, if, if there was no foods available uh, for them because of, of um, uh, droughts or, or, um, uh, that were happening, they had to go back to what they call fallback foods, things that would still give them some nutrition, but things you know, that they couldn't live on very long, right? Fallback foods. This is, this is what's important about that. The interesting thing is we still have those uh, genetic profiles and blueprints in us so that we have to have cognitive flexibility. And, and the whole industrial world suffers from that. When you look at hunter-gatherer kids, very different than Western kids. I grew up like a hunter-gatherer kid, you know. I'm 66 years old, and back in the day when we were leaving, walking from White Shield, our little community, we'd walk down to the river, which was about, you know, 10 kilometers or about six miles away, through the hills, across roads, and we'd be catching rattlesnakes on the way, looking at birds in their nests, chasing baby jackrabbits, uh, you know, uh, walking, you know, very gingerly around uh, patches of poison ivy and, and and, um, and, and stopping and just, you know, looking at rocks as we went. And that whole thing was that it was developing our cognitive flexibility, right? Our parents let us do it. You know, today that would be called child neglect, right? But hunter-gatherer kids do that now today in this, in this so-called modern world. That's how they learn. They go out and they discover and they, and they have to make decisions for themselves. Not that they're not guided at some point, but they had a lot more agency and ability to move throughout the terrain to, to discover things, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's why our brain's executive function suffers. And, and, and we end up with uh, you know, all kinds of uh, 
um, uh, diseases of the brain or distraction diseases or gratification diseases, right? So movement also increases something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, what uh, John uh, Rately calls miracle growth for the brain. And when you run and you exercise, your brain, your brain starts to produce more of this BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but as it, it produces more of that particular factor in your brain, you grow more brain cells more brain cells. And that's probably why the Chimene Indians uh, down in the Bolivian rainforest uh, don't get as much uh, Alzheimer's or dementia as we do, right? They move and they're moving all day, right? Maybe they run every now and then from a jaguar or they run after a caiman crocodile or catch it or whatever. But they're also, they're all not only hunter gatherers, but they're also uh, traditional horticulturalists. So as you can see, you know, movement is just so important. So let's go down to the last bullet point here. This is what Western science is kind of, one of its contributions, right? Um, as if we didn't know, but it, 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 now they can label it and tell us you know, a particular kind of um, uh, uh, expression that happens in, in a particular hormone or an enzyme in the body. Um, exercise and movement protects us from depression by increasing the skeletal muscle caririnine, aminotransferase, CAT increases that in the body. When we start running and moving, it begins to increase this expression, right? Because when we sit, we build up the next thing, the neurotoxic kyrinine, K-Y-N. It's building up in our bodies all the time. Our bodies are meant to move. It's, it's the body's way of saying decline, right? Decline, decay, right? When you're moving, your body says thrive, and it gives the signals and the neurotoxic kyrinine that's gonna cause depression, boom, starts to go down. And then you go to the production of kyrinetic acid, which is a protective factor, which we need in our body. This is why when you look at hunter-gatherer populations, you looked at our ancestors a long time ago, they would put us to shame with their, with their skeletal muscle, right? I mean, their bones are undoubtedly much stronger and thicker than ours were, and more healthy, uh, because they moved a lot. And their chances of having depression versus our chances of having depression living in a Western society was so much less because of the lifestyle. So we have to remember that, that whole circle on colonization, those factors, there came into our lives and the lives of the community an invasive force that said, you don't need to move, you need to be on a reserve or a reservation or a rancheria, you know, and so on. And at that point, you started, we started getting sick and people started dying, right? And then, then they started getting obesity and diabetes because of the lack of movement. So now in the colonization period, what we do is we go to a CrossFit gym and we work out. That's our, um, that's our, that's our colonized way of dealing with you know, uh, weight and, and uh, obesity. Or for our diabetes, we take insulin, right? That's the colonization of it. So again, this is, this is something, now this is all has to do again, not only with the, with the body and the physical fitness, but also the brain and how important that is, right? Dancing, uh, in, the, in the model I talked about before, dancing is so important. Um, I don't have it in this particular slide. I wish I would pull, pull out the other slide, but one of the slides, uh, some of the research that I've looked at is that um, evolutionary science has said, we evolved to dance in unison. Right? We dance in unison with one another. And, um, you know, like you're doing the tango, if you're having, you know, uh, grass, grass dancers or jingle da uh, dress dancers are dancing, team, team dancing, right? People do that, you know, because it's, it's mirror, it's a, has a mirroring effect. And the one thing I thought, wow, this is, this is really cool, because I didn't know that before, and I've seen people do that, right? All perform kind of in unison. When I looked at bird murmurations, if you've ever seen those birds, like those starlings fly, thousands and thousands together in these perfect patterns in the sky that's what they call murmurations right or if you've ever looked at a school of fish just spinning in these huge balls in the ocean they call it schooling right so humans are also the same way right if back in the day if uh you know people were doing a victory dance in my tribe you know people were all dancing in uni unison to the drum right so what's what's happening what's happening in the brain when people dance or they sing, right? This particular study shows us that, that um, 
that endocannabinoid rise concentra concentration rises happen in the brain and singing significantly increases the di these different levels of endocannabinoids you know uh, three different kinds you know in these uh, healthy postmenopausal females and enhance their mood right that's true now about all you know about everyone right this particular study was looking at this particular um, um, group dancing endocannabinoids increase uh, in the brain and improve the mood and cycling on a bike also increase particular kinds of endocannabinoids. Uh, very positive effects. Look at this, singing, the most beneficial activity, right? And these were people that were uh, enjoyed singing, right? Who doesn't enjoy singing, right? Uh, it's an enjoyable activity. When our ancestors sang songs, they had all kinds of songs, prayer songs, morning songs, death songs, birth songs, celebration songs, you know, humorous songs, uh, children's songs, and, and uh, you know, songs when they met other tribes or songs of, you know, awe and wonderment about the universe or storytelling. We evolved to sing, it just not only did we evolve to sing, but we evolved to sing in unison too, just like a choir, right? Just like when you hear crickets at night. I used to think about that when I used to meditate and, you know, back home at night, you know, uh, out in the Great Plains, you know, you hear all the coyotes around and all the animals, but boy, the crickets have these choirs that just come in and out, in and out. And, um, um, you know, birds fly those murmurations, humans do the dance, and it raises endocannabinoids. So what about it, right? It's not only is it enjoyable, but this um, biochemical signaling improves mood, reduces stress and anxiety enhances our memory there's a brain function there look at that protects brain function reduces pain so already you got a couple of things to improve your brain right run move sing and dance right we already know that these are things some of the first things that were outlawed among indigenous people taking away your dance colonizing your movement colonizing your singing and your expression colonizing you know you and all these different us and there's different kinds of ways so it's very important to remember that you know that you should be dancing, you should be singing, right? Should people should be singing together? And if you can imagine endocannabinoids rising in the body, you know, when you do that, you're going to see um, resilience building. But let me let me, let me go on. Laughter. Laughter is a huge, huge genetic advantage for some people. Huge. We know that from some of these studies that like Claudia Haas, you know, at Northwestern University and others who have been studying uh, the neuroscience of, of humor and laughter, understand now that humor and laughter actually comes down to DNA differences. You know, I always wondered about that. I mean, my son sent me something yesterday um, on Facebook and uh, it was a thread, you know, and, and um, all these young native men were laughing at this joke, you know, which other people say, well, that's probably inappropriate to laugh at, right? But they were all creating this, they were creating this sort of, uh, you know, uh, talking about this, the, the situation that was happening and everyone was adding things on. And you read it, it was pretty hilarious, right? But someone else may say, well, that's kind of inappropriate to say, right? But it's not, you know, that's, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that folks like that, and I'm certainly one of those people that, that has these uh, variants, short alleles, uh, this particular gene, the serotonin transporter gene, or the 5-HTT uh, LPR, uh, with those genes, laugh more. They smile more when they watch cartoons or hear funny stories or, or they tease or whatever it is, right, than people with the long alleles. Interestingly enough, people with the long alleles come from, like, um, uh, uh, Western European countries, right? And they, they um, like the British, for example, don't necessarily have... Uh, the, um, the um, long alleles where they need to have a greater expression of humor, of teasing, of laughter, of smiles and positive sort of uh, facial expressions. People with the short alleles, uh, like I call people with the, the funny bone gene, uh, flourish in a positive environment where there is teasing. And that's where you can get back to, and a lot of indigenous people will have a culture of teasing. There's certain people you can tease, you know, like uh, on my mother's side, um, um, Hidatsa, there, there are certain people I can't tease. Certain people you're sort of obligated to tease, you know, in these loving kind of funny ways. And um, and I remember when I was growing up as a kid in my community, grandmothers were, were, were great teasers and jokesters, you know, and funny stories. I can still remember a lot of stories, you know, um, that they said or things that they did. 
And I still laugh about them today when I, I'm reminded to visit with relatives or my, my siblings or, or, or some of those elders that may still be around, not too many of them around. So what, what happens then when you put them in a place like a residential school or a boarding school? There's no laughter there, right? It's not only is it sad, not only is it scary, but your one tool to help uh, balance your emotions and help you know, bring you out of this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, trauma that you may be in is taken away from you. Your humor is colonized, right? Humor is colonized. So then you, what you're doing is you're actually you know, uh, silencing a very important genetic uh, expression. You know, um, indigenous people laughed at a lot of things for different reasons, right? But let me move on from that. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can hit that soon. Um, in their particular study, uh, uh, this Joan Chiao down, down there, you know, it's been about 11, 11, almost 12 years now that this study was done. But there's been other studies that have talked about, you know, whether or not this, this particular gene, you know, um, does, what, does what they say it does. I, I, I'm convinced it does. But collectivist cultures like indigenous cultures, more significantly having individuals with a funny bone gene, right? Carrying the short allele of this uh, serotonin transfer gene. Think about that. What does laughter do? Well, it increases the brain derived neurotrophic factor. Remember, that protects your brain. That's what it does. It protects your brain and increases uh, brain cells, right? BDNF. When you run, it increases. When you laugh, it increases. Good stuff. You need to do it. But laughter also does this it improves memory and learning, lowers your cortisol, which is your adrenaline like you know, fight or flight um, uh, chemistry. Uh, relaxes your blood vessels, brings down your blood pressure, boosts your immunity, and releases uh, endorphins along with endocannabinoids, right? All these things working together. This is why we were gifted or why we developed humor in the first place as human beings. We should be laughing, right? Should we laugh at trauma? I think so. I think that when we start looking at people long ago, how they counted coup on trauma, or they counted coup on death, or they uh, did these exercises and they laughed, or you know, at death or whatever they did, right? Today that seems pretty bizarre to us, but back, or they laughed at their hunger, you know, what was going on? So we we can we can see um, we can see that in just a few slides here. So the effects on sleep of wellness, colonized sleep. We need more sleep. Our circadian rhythms have been disrupted. Our molecular clock that keeps in sync with the sun's uh, rising and, and, and you know, falling in darkness is broken down. You know, in this uh, society where we're, we're living with all kinds of floodlights, sitting, looking at laptops late at night or watching TV or Netflix or whatever it is. Right. And, and when it does that, it increases our risk for, you know, things like dementia, Alzheimer's, right, diabetes, heart disease. Our brain actually shrinks. That's those studies have been done. We're colonized by our cell phones, tablets, televisions, floodlights. All these things are happening in, in society. Sleep is crucial for all of us. Kids, parents, elders, right? Very important. Uh, hormones, growth hormones and infection fighting proteins are released uh, when, we're, um, you know, when we're sleeping. And of course, it affects our ability to learn and to remember. <laughs> So circadian rhythms look like this. Um, you know, we get up at a particular time in the morning. I get up, I get up kind of right about here. And I get and go outside and I get my workout and my meditation in. And uh, my highest alertness time, sometimes I, I, when I can, I'm writing or I'm playing my tenor saxophone or sometimes I'm, uh, you know, just uh, writing or I, I said that already, but um, doing those kinds of things. Best coordination, fastest reaction time. So these, this is just kind of a general kind of idea what it looks like. But the, the key thing is that in the great circle of life, we know this. All beings that we know of, living beings, have a circadian rhythm clock that they go by. And it's, as we say, endogenously generated sort of within, you know, because the, the systems are working inside all the way down to the microbial level and the genetic level. They're also modulated or influenced by external things that are happening, like sunlight or temperature, right? Um, the other thing is that they're, they're, they're found in all animals and, and feeding patterns of all of us, right? We, we figured that out. I can tell you this, 
the circadian rhythms of hunter-gatherer people are very different than they are of people in the Western world. And I can almost guarantee you this, that our ancestors had very, very different circadian rhythms because they weren't up all night. We have not um, mutated enough our, our, our genes in order to benefit from staying up late or missing sleep, right? It's, it's gonna eventually have a detrimental effects. Right? So um, what about, what about um, adaptive stress? I don't have that in here, but it should be labeled as adaptive stress. Things that we challenge ourselves with. Well, one of the things we can challenge ourselves with is uh, things like um, sitting in a hot sweat lodge or a hot sauna. A lot of times people think about um, sweat lodges as only a place of ceremony. And, uh, but that's not true about all tribes. My tribe for, uh, as, as, as a group uh, used to enjoy what we call sweat baths. There was no ceremony in there, although we did have ceremonial sweat lodges. So people, uh, the elders would get in the sweat lodge and it was you know, back in the day where there was sort of segregation between the older men and older women and, and they accepted that. The men would go in one lodge and the women would go in the other lodge you know, if there were, uh, um, and, uh, if there were uh, other, other folks you know, who had different sexual orientations may go split themselves between the different lodges, right? Um, but the idea is that they didn't go into the lodge to pray, they went into the lodge to sit there to experience the heat maybe to sing a song or to talk to each other, to gossip, to uh, scrub their bodies with uh, cedar and sage and sweet grass to clean themselves off, um, remove the old skin, the dead skin, and, and just be in there for a while and, 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 to, and to challenge themselves in that way. But while they were sitting in there, just like if you sit in a very hot sauna, you sit in a very hot sauna, um, you know, what it does is it challenges the body, challenges the cells, and um, inside our cells are, are called heat shock proteins, right? These are found in the cells and they, they're very important for what they call protein misfolding and folding, right? As we age, our protein structure begins to deteriorate a bit. If we're under high stress, if we're, if we're living with trauma, if we invite those kinds of things into our life, we don't get enough sleep, we don't eat right, we don't exercise, we're going to get more protein misfolding in our body, and that's detrimental. You know, it's detrimental to our body. The one um, thing that I remember uh, some years ago was mad cow disease. When you think about uh, mad cow disease, if you've ever seen a brain that's been uh, ravaged by mad cow disease, well, the brain gets eaten out by the things called prions, which are which start the proteins from uh, misfolding in the brain and sort of eats away the brain. Um, our brain shrinks as we get older. If uh, uh, but not for Chimene Indians, it doesn't shrink like it does for us in Western society or in industrial society. Why? Because they do, they do these things that challenge their body. So in, in this sense, um, the protein structure is maintained when, you, when you're in these really hot saunas, or even if you're sitting in a very ice cold pool, or if you get up every morning, you take a five minute very cold shower, right? It's gonna have the same effect. It's gonna produce more heat shock proteins in your cells. Western science has shown that high levels and they've studied uh, groups of people who have you know who have put themselves in these uh, climates where they're very hot or very cold and when they look at the cells they can find out they have higher levels of heat shock proteins we know now there's a strong association with uh, with a uh, longer life more longevity if we have higher levels of heat shock proteins disease protection and healthy skeletal muscles right again ceremonially speaking uh, these were things that were prohibited you know that you couldn't sit in the sauna because it was you know something that um, um, you know, settlers didn't understand, right? Or it was like, why, why are you doing those kinds of things? But um, again, very important. So fasting uh, is another one of those things I was talking about earlier. And um, what what uh, is the uh, what's going on with obesity? You know, and overweight status of of uh, this again. I'm sorry, I apologize for this. This was I was showing this to teachers. Uh, I've got another slide that you know uh, uh, that talks more generally. Um, so when, we, when you start thinking about, you know, um, the mind and the body, right, and contemplation and genetics, fasting affects every one of these areas. It changes the neuroplasticity of the brain. The brain actually changes in structure and function. You know, it, uh, there's, there's a, a release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor when you're fasting from food. Just, just, just drinking water, and what that means is you're going to be growing more brain cells, right? Why? Well, because 
your body realizes that you're sort of in a state where you probably need more brain cells to hunt or to gather or to be more creative to feed yourself or your family, right? Um, and this is uh, exactly what, what happens to uh, populations. And what happens if you're fasting to the microbes and the, the bacteria in your belly? Well, they become more diverse and some of them become even more um, populous in your, in your belly. It's things uh, that are called like acromancia eucinophilia. And it's a big, it's a big long sort of term for a bacteria. But these particular bacteria um, feast on the, on, on the mucus in the body and send signals, their genes send signals to our genes to like something's going on, right? They're trying to send a signal. And so when we fast a lot, not only do we lose weight, right? But our muscle, um, our muscle, uh, muscles get uh, more defined and grow more, right? It's like it's preparing us to, again, to move, right? So what about contemplative practices and fasting? Of course, the same thing happens to the brain here. The brain goes into a state where it goes, um, it, it, it's, um, it, it, it controls what they call the default mode network that sometimes that's scattered all over the place. You're thinking about all kinds of things like, well, I'm thinking about historical trauma. I'm thinking about those 215 uh, kids that were uncovered. Then I'm thinking about my dinner. Now I'm thinking about this. Now I'm thinking about that. And that's our uh, uh, default mode network, which is just kind of floating around there. When we practice fasting, our body brings our mind to that center place again so we can focus and concentrate which is why spiritual traditions all around the world have used fasting to kind of raise you know their their levels of, of focus on the prayer and on insight to create enlightenment to create connections you know and um, transcend you know um, their their selves here on you know what they're doing so they could you know answer very difficult questions that, that lay before them finally Fasting then also changes uh, um, uh, the expression of our genes, right? Same thing. Um, when we're fasting for certain periods of time, uh, gen uh, our genes, our problematic genes, get silenced, right? Why? Because it's giving off this, um, this um, uh, notion, right, that I'm healthy, right? I'm no longer burning all this uh, glucose in my, in my bloodstream, you know, uh, or my pancreas is no longer going crazy because I'm drinking big, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, drinks from um, of Starbucks with, you know, chocolate mocha and sugar in them. Or I'm, I'm, or I'm, I'm, st I'm not eating, you know, all this uh, sugar. I'm not eating these desserts, those kinds of things. The body begins to kind of shift into a whole nother place, which then gives signals to uh, uh, our, uh, an epigenetic signal then that then begins to help heal um, or silence, you know, problematic uh, genes. So this is, let me bring something together here. So I've been talking about fasting and uh, this is a, a, a quote that was in, in uh, 1636, way back when, among these um, uh, Montane Indian hunter-gatherers in Canada by this Jesuit uh, missionary, Paul Lejeune, who was, uh, uh, who was uh, you know, um, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess he was ministering among them or something, you know, but uh, he was there spending time with them. And, you know, of course, he wrote very negatively about them in some, you know, because, uh, you know, he couldn't, couldn't see them having, you know, too many values. But then again, on the other side, he saw a lot of values, their friendliness, their, their sharing, their working together, and, of course, their humor. And so here he's talking about a time when they were going without food for a period of time. And uh, he said, I saw them suffer in, in their hardship, right? They weren't eating. They didn't have any food. And labor with cheerfulness and still doing their work, still taking care of business. And then he's talking about himself as someone who's used to eating three meals a day or whatever he was eating, you know, in the, in the church or whatever, you know, uh, saw them uh, uh, threat. I uh, found myself with them so, uh, threatened with great suffering. And they said to me, quote, we shall be sometimes two days, sometimes three without eating for lack of food and sometimes more. Take courage, Jeannie. Let thy soul to be strong, to endure suffering and hardship. Keep thyself from being sad. Otherwise, thou will be sick. Right? So they're giving him some really important information about, you know, trauma, right? See how we do not cease to laugh, even though we have little to eat. Now, let's go back a little bit. And they're saying, well, now these Indians here, they're laughing at their hunger. Well, not in the Western society. We get hangry, right? We get mad. You know, we're going to kill somebody if we don't, get our, we don't get a food, get a snack or whatever it is. They have the genetics that are working together here, right? They're collectivist people working together, laboring together, 
but they also are people with this particular genetic variant, the funny bone gene that I mentioned, the serotonin transporter gene, or the 5-HTTP LPR a gene that is, you know, uh, that ha has, they have the ability to laugh at their hunger. They have the ability to laugh at, you know, the uncertainty. They have the ability to laugh at the trauma of having no food. It's there, right? It's there. And that's, that's part of the, the genetic um, blueprint that I was talking about earlier. So what about benefits? We know this, that not only does, uh, from uh, Mark Matson's uh, laboratory, um, we know that fasting also has these really profound uh, effects on the body and the brain, right? Improved glucose regulation. I got to stand up here, I'm here for a minute. Um, this is my chair, I got my stand up desk here. A loss of abdominal fat with the maintenance of muscle mass, reduced blood pressure and heart rate, increased heart rate variability, similar to what occurs in trained endurance athletes, improved learning and memory and motor functions, protection right, of the brain against all these different kinds of things, uh, Parkinson's, stroke, Alzheimer's, you know, all these dementias, Huntington's disease. Here is the part again where I talk about adaptive stress. Matson discovered in his work, and Matson is, you know, he's a big time, he's a big time neuroscientist. Uh, I think he, he was at uh, Johns Hopkins University, but now I think he's uh, retired from there doing his own uh, research. But intermittent fasting is beneficial for health because it improves a challenge to cells, imposes a challenge to cells. That's what I'm talking about, adaptive stress. We challenge our bodies, right? We challenge our bodies. And those cells, our cells respond and they adapt to that stress and enhance their ability to cope with stress and resist disease, right? So the longer you go without food and you practice that, the more your body and the cells will respond to that, right? The longer you sit in a hot you know, sauna or a very hot sweat lodge, you know, you do that four times a week, you know, for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, those cells are gonna respond, right? And um, once they respond like that, as I mentioned before, the heat shock proteins are gonna increase. And they're going to help you uh, increase longevity. They're going to help you cope with stress and resist disease. Right. So, um, being outside is another um, one of the things that I mentioned. Of course, um, I've just got one slide here. But what we know is that now that in a Western society, Richard, people like Richard uh, Loeb have talked about um, what we suffer from nature deficit disorder. We're no longer in touch with our, our, our outside world like we used to be, right? Uh, different reasons for that, you know, all this electronic communications and, you know, all these distractions. And if you're living in a city, there's poor urban planning and uh, the disappearance of uh, space and so on. And street traffic, you know, you don't want to go out walking down the street, you get run over and, you know, you get hit on a bike or those kinds of things. Um, and then all this new evidence is coming, showing that, you know, the, the deficit we, we experience from, um, from not being in um, nature diminishes you know, our, our senses, right? We don't smell as much, and, uh, smell as well as we did or feel and sense things as well as we, we have, you know, our attention difficulties. Why? Well, because when we walk through a forest, you know, we have to step over logs and step over branches and watch out for wood ticks and watch out for, you know, things, you know, um, snakes and things like that. Something our ancestors did. In fact, this is like the cutting edge science right now in neuroscience for prevention of Alzheimer's and dementias, is that they say, well, um, uh, running on a treadmill is, is good. You know, it'll help you know, reduce your chances of getting Alzheimer's and dementias. Uh, walking outside around your block is even better. But going through the woods or up hills that you, know, you don't know is the best because you're learning to navigate those systems and your brain is using a number of complex uh, processes to organize all that information and remember it in split seconds. So you do that. So you're increasing, again, the brain-derived neurotrophic rise in the brain as you're not only exercising, but as you're training the brain to take in all this information, right? Our ancestors did that. Hunter-gatherer populations do that. We don't do that, right? Because we have paved streets and we've got, you know, stop signs and, and street lights and, and uh, all those kinds of things, right? Um, it, it, we don't have to do much work. Our brains can stay lazy or distracted. Finally, um, all these problems are um, 
are, are kind of uh, linked to what they call the epidemic of inactivity. The thing about this too is that I mentioned uh, in another slide that I don't have in here is the importance of independent play. Hunter-gatherer children, hunter-gatherer populations uh, play way more than we do in industrial society. There's a lot more independent play going on and uh, playing together, you know, in games that they're they're using sort of movement, they're using sort of unified movement, they're using thinking games. Children are, are doing that all the time, and if you let them go on the playgrounds, uh, they're they're creating games and they're moving through their games. Sometimes they change the rule in the middle of games, and other kids got to say, "Hey, you can't do that. It's not fair." But then they, they have to keep up with that. Same thing happens with us, you know, um, when we when we're doing that kind of independent play, you know, uh, ourselves and running and jumping over logs and going up hills and those kinds of things. So um, this is, you know, look at this outside magazine here. It says, you know, this is uh, science's uh, newest miracle drug, right? Uh, this is something, again, our ancestors knew, something that Western science is coming back around and saying, gee, you know, we're scratching our heads. I guess maybe being outside is more important than staying inside all the whole time. So all of these things I've been talking about lead to what we call cognitive resilience in neurosciences. A lot of people talk about resilience, right? So resilient here, resilient there, whatever. We now have at least uh, some way to kind of identify where it is in the brain. And this part of the brain is called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex or the VMPFC. I have all these weird ways of remembering things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'll say, well, how do I remember that when I was first learning it? Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So I'd have some kind of reference point to that. Brain-derived neurotrophic tropic factor. Hmm, that sounds like big darn native fella. That's right. That's that's what it is. So I made that up in my head. So when I'm on my run, I'm running down the road and I'm thinking, wow, there's this big native fella in my brain and he's pouring this brain drive neurotrophic factor in my brain. So it's growing more and more. So thank you, big native fella. Right? So I'm running along thinking about that. So same thing with a ventral medial prefrontal cortex, VMPFC. I think, well, where is it located? It's located the underside of the brain you know, between both hemispheres, kind of right between your eyes under your, eye, your, your eyebrow or your uh, brow there and up in that area. So I'm thinking, well, this part of the brain is holding up all the trauma and it needs to be all the resilience and it's probably mad about having to do that So and doing this grunt work. So I call it the very mad private first class. So that's how I remember it, right? V and PFC. Um, uh, so what's going on in this part of the brain? Well, look at this activation happening here. Very, very actively coping, you know, with whatever uh, 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 cognitive stress that's going on. Here we see one where there is no activation going on, very risky coping. In fact, we're seeing a, a turndown here of these, uh, in these different systems. Here we're seeing, you know, uh, really nice activation. So what is cognitive resilience? It's this capacity that we have we all have this to overcome negative um, um, uh, effects on our, our or our stress uh, on our cognitive functioning right in order to get back to where we do that we have to get to bullet point number two and said how did we, how did we do that right prior experience our ancestors devised many many ways to train us to deal with high levels of stress and uncertainty right i mentioned that to you before as kids going through rites of passage, they didn't go through one weekend as a rite of passage or a workshop. These kids did this over and over again, sitting in very cold mountain, you know, streams, or they, or they sat, you know, or if you were in Northern California where I was, some of the tribes would swim in the cold op ocean, um, uh, open ocean, you know, where there were great white sharks, and um, they, or they would run up mountains at night when it was cold. These young people, and and they just didn't do it one night and then they got their badge or they got their feather. I mean, they did it all over and over again because it was a training. They realized that life was stressful and it was gonna take a lot, a lot of training. And people were, and the young, uh, and folks who went through this had to deal with uncertainty in life. And when you can deal with uncertainty in life, it improves your cognitive resilience, your cognitive functioning. Um, and um, so I've got some stories about that too as well. But so here we're looking at the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the very mad private first class, where it's uh, located in the prefrontal cortex, um, in the frontal lobe, here in this part of the brain, it's the front part of the brain, at the bottom of the cerebral hemispheres. Like I said, if you put your finger right where your nose sort of breaks off from your, from your skull and, and push there where your brow is kind of uh, there, 
that's kind of under there you would find your uh, VMPFC. Um, and what is it, you know, uh, what does it do? What is, it's implicated in the processing of risk and fear. And that's very important. Very important to process, you know, the risk of doing something like running up a mountain at night with only your prayer stick and you've got, you know, um, 20 other, you know, young people behind you and you're, and you're the oldest person in the group is 12 years old and you're running at night where there are grizzly bears and mountain lions, but mountain spirits, right? And you have to take the risk of taking certain trails and lead the group and deal with your process, your fear. And then, of course, in order to do that, you have to inhibit your emotional responses. You can't scream and cry and whatever. And, and so maybe this gets back to the point of the stoic Indian, right? People say, oh, the Indians aren't stoic. But if you think about that, when you think about you know, how they maintain some of their emotional responses during ceremony, then you think, hmm, maybe there's something to that because they were going through rites of passage and going through different kinds of training to make them strong, to make them healthy, to, uh, to deal with all these uncertainties of life. And of course, very important in the process of decision-making and self-control, right? I've got to make the right decision that, that sort of matches up with risk and self-control, right? Which matches up with fear and the, and the inhibition of emotional responses. I have to, you know, I can't shed tears. I can't scream. I can't cry. I, I've got to maintain a sense of strength and, and focus as I'm doing this kind of thing, right? Um, so we went. So if you go back to the time where um, that sort of changed in Western psychology, that's when we started to say that you know people were sort of uh, uh, stuffing their feelings. You're stuffing your feelings, right? And that's. Uh, but our ancestors, you could say, well, they were stuffing their feelings, but they were also creating um, something that I think goes beyond or transcends that whole idea of stuffing feelings that they were developing a very, very strong, uh, resilient coping mechanism in the brain when they were you know, being very, very um, um, uh, uh, sparse and very, very calculated about what kinds of emotions that needed to be expressed, which is why I, I was just, I'm just working on an article now uh, about um, healthy indigenous aging. And I was writing about my grandmother. I said, in this article, I'm writing about these older ladies when I was a kid. My, my grandmother has been gone since 1988. She died at age 92. But when I was a little kid, you know, in the community hall, in our, in our, in our reservation community, I remember all the old ladies, you know, when, when they sang a certain kind of uh, memory or, uh, or um, uh, some kind of a song that, you know, kind of about the past or someone's song, they call it someone's song or, or about history. All these ladies would just start wailing just really loud, you know, and it would be like a bunch of them in the room just wailing. You know, or, or outside, you know, they'd be just crying and crying, just really wailing loud. And I remember I'd look as a little kid, and of course, you know, that was accepted thing. And of course, what they were doing is they were allowing themselves to have that emotional release at that time, and they would hold those emotional responses back at other times. So they were very, very calculated about how they were doing that kind of thing, right? She lived to be 92, and, and my grandmother, like a lot of those older women and men at that time, were very different, and of course, generations before that. They were even closer to this kind of uh, what I'm talking about. So in the very last sentence here, here we're talking about the cognitive evaluation of morality. The ventral medial prefrontal cortex, when you push yourself through all these things I'm talking about, fasting, when you're running, you're dancing, and you're singing the songs, you know, and you're sleeping well, and you're laughing, and you're... Um, pushing yourself to adaptive stress, to, to sit in environments or situations where it's, you're very uncomfortable with, without no food and you're fasting or it's very hot. All those kinds of things as you train yourself through that are going to activate the ventral medial prefrontal cortex in the front part of your brain, which then again leads to all of these different kinds of um, processes here, right? The inhibition of emotional responses. Um, and of course, decision-making, self-control, risk and fear. And of course, the final one is cognitive uh, evaluation of morality. So um, I had a chance to live in Northern California in, in the lands of the uh, Yurok and the Wiat and the Hoopa and uh, some of the other tribes up there. And I, I visited with some of the elders and intellectuals of the community. And uh, I was learning about this at the time and I talked to some of the, those folks. And what they told me, just fit this like a T. They had their young people running up mountains 
at night, you know, when it was cold and all they had on were these cedar, you know, skirts and vests and, you know, uh, maybe a cedar headband with a prayer stick running up these mountains, you know, very cold. And of course there were the mountain lions and the bears and of course the mountain spirits. So they had to run through that and they were trained to do that, right? They were being trained and, and, and also guided to do that. They also swam in the open ocean where there were great white sharks and, you know, that, that sort of thing. And of course, as they swam, they had to control their fear and process the risk of, you know, being there at that time and make good decisions and control their self, their, uh, their self-control. And, and at the end of this, I, 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 one of my students who I knew I was interested in writing about this in that area came into my, uh, uh, my office and he brought me an article uh, about this, about uh, this kind of training that, that I think it was the Eurox that were actually going through this. And it was written by an anthropologist and I, I read it. And, Toward the very end, he said, you know, he said, the people that went through this had all these different kinds of uh, characteristics that you're seeing here in front of you. But he also mentioned, he said, you know, these folks that go through this become the strongest, most courageous, the, the, um, the most helpful, most compassionate, uh, people with the highest morality, highest morals of anybody, of, of the people in the tribe, right? And that, that you know, my... Everything just kind of went, wow, you know, all the bells went off. I'm like, okay, now I understand. Why? Because they're putting themselves in that place where they understand the sacredness of life. So morality then becomes more of a factor that they're familiar with. It's not something abstract. It's like, wow, you know, we've been through the, we've been through this struggle. We've been through this training. We've been through this difficulty. It's part of who we are. And in order to see the goodness, you have to quiet the risk and the fear and the emotional response, negative responses. And from that, you know, rises things like uh, morality and doing good and being compassionate. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, another side of the uh, medicine wheel here, about the spirit and, and the um, art and science of mindfulness and the power of the mind. So we know that mindfulness, um, just in itself, I talked about it, is it's not only being aware of the present moment, but it's also about who am I connected to? What am I connected to, right? And how is my mind colonized and sculpted? And you know, what, do, what did I get from my ancestors? What do I get from my foods, right? The environments I'm in. So if we were to look at mindfulness, and I, I, I call it indigenous mindfulness or neurodecolonization, as I said earlier, right? The idea about how do we develop neural networks in our brain that are going to that are going to be healing for us well if we look at mindfulness here it's you know practice of maintaining this non-judgmental state you know of uh, awareness of your thoughts and emotions and um just being aware and not seeing them as something that you're overcome by right with trauma or whatever it is but you're 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 respecting them and seeing them so that's the that's the definition of mindfulness well meditation is well it's a practice of concentrating our, our mindfulness on a sound, a phrase, an object, or a prayer, a movement, whatever it is, or attention you know, itself, in order to increase our awareness of the present moment, reduce our stress, all the way down to promoting uh, spiritual growth. And this is why mindfulness or meditation has been a part of all cultures for as long as you know we know. Um, in this particular slide, it's like it's a lot about when you're in you're in a in a state about prayer deep contemplative prayer for example or ceremony you're not judging the ceremony you know you may attach to it or you may not you may just like, see the ceremony move on and, and and see the beauty of it happening but you're paying attention to what's happening you know to you to your breath and the ceremony you accept the feelings that come up strong feelings hard feelings small feelings and always present moment awareness of what's going on there are different kinds of things that that um, that you know uh, approaches that are used. Um, I, I just finished a curriculum for um, young people in my uh, community uh, for Rikara people, and so um, besides sitting, walking, listening, eating meditations, there's open monitoring, like kind of being in contact with you know all the sounds and the feelings that are all around you, and just breathing and being in touch with those, and this deep belly, uh, um, uh, breathing through the belly. I got breathing, breathing, but it should be belly breathing. Um, and also other practices like uh, sending loving kindness to others and, and connecting, you know, to uh, everything around you in, in, a, in a loving and compassionate way. Scanning your body, um, some that I, I 
one I created called uh, uh, Earth Scan, right? The body tells you something when you scan it and you meditate and you send your thoughts all through and say, how's my, how are my legs doing? How's my heart doing? How's my emotions doing? And so on. Uh, I, committed, I created a, one that was kind of based upon a, a, a concept in my tribe called, you know, the earth is trying to tell us something, right? We look at the, at not the wisa, the mother, you know, who's coming, right? It's trying to tell us something. Um, and of course, um, 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 uh, visualization and, and breath awareness, right? How, how my breath comes in, how it leaves my body. Um, but this virup, uh, uh, which means virup, which means knowing how or knowing, right? This, this idea of knowing how to cultivate full awareness of the of the body and the mind. So that's kind of, it's an indigenous practice. Um, I'm just giving you the title. I can't I do the practice with you right now, um, which is something I've been working on. But uh, there's also this this other uh, practice that um, that I've been um, working on too as well, and it's um, it's sishu uh, tunuk ri uh, which is uh, uh, ik. I'm sorry, uh, which is a Rikara phrase that means uh, uh, the mind that is calm or at peace or something. There, there's beauty in that, and it it's, it's it moves with all things, right? So it's kind of hard. It's really hard to kind of say this in in uh, English, but generally that's what it means: is that uh, you know this mind that is peaceful, you know, is is it has this kind of Kind of aura about it, or and, and, it, and it, it's it's able to move with all things, right? It's able to kind of just flow with things, right? Um, what do we know about mindfulness then? Um, a lot of things. We know that it preserves the the aging brain, and and again with all the other things, this is how we protect the brain. Uh, reduces activity in the brain's me center, rather about me than it's about all of us, right? Which is why I think you'll find uh, uh, collectivist cultures like indigenous cultures were more about you know. Um, all for one and one for all kind of thinking. It's about all of us, right? Um, and uh, and then also its uh, um, effects are, are, are very, very strong in terms of uh, uh, managing depression and anxiety. You know, it rivals any antidepressants. Uh, meditation does lead to volume changes um, in the brain. In just a few days uh, of training improves concentration and attention. Of course, reduces anxiety, social anxiety, and can help with addiction. Um, in schools, I, something I work with uh, students in schools, uh, improve the attention of the kids, uh, better performance and object tasks, you know, um, um, builds compassion, you know, kids are more likely to help someone in need and have greater uh, compassion and greater self-compassion, which is why, you know, um, the things I've been talking about earlier about um, the uh, cognitive um, uh, uh, part of the brain, uh, cognitive resilience, you know, is, is also about compassion. It's also about training the brain you know, to uh, stay focused. Uh, emotional regulation, of course, again, it's the same thing. Uh, just like um, everything else I talked about, it corresponds with less reactivity and the better ability to engage in tasks, even when emotions are activated, right? Finally, this calming, right? Reduces feelings of stress, improves anxiety. Uh, so these things, if you can imagine that, that I was talking about, which are indigenous things, are traditional, or, I won't call them traditional, but they're indigenous things. There are things that you know all sort of you know help with the with the emotions and the compassion and attention and calming. Of course, they affect the body and the brain. Um, I'm going to um, run through these. I know I'm kind of I'm getting a little bit short on time. Um, may, um, Sam, can you uh, can you come back on and tell me how much time I have? Yes, absolutely. I appreciate your mind, <laughs> your 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 awareness and mindfulness towards the the time remaining. Um, let's let's go uh, perhaps another five ten minutes and then and then we can open it up to Q and A. Okay, okay. So let me just kind of speed through some of these slides. This slide here is what I call enzymatic colonization. That our our brains can actually be colonized. You know, when we're uh, under chronic stress and trauma, and what happens is that these little things are called dendritic spines. They're associated with, uh, with memory and learning and uh, creativity. And stress actually breaks them down. They break off when there's too much stress. And that's, uh, that's not good because then it affects our sensory um, uh, capacities and our ability to kind of, um, you know, uh, have good motor learning, to, to have good uh, memory, to, to have, you know, uh, uh, and, and also uh, movement and, and those kinds of things. They're associated uh, with learning, you know, as I said, in a big way. The, the thing about that is that 
you know, um, as we look at it and see uh, how they're growing, you know, postnatal after babies are born, uh, there's the spinogenesis, they're growing, right? And so they're, uh, by the time adolescence is they're, they're growing more and they've got formed ones, some of the baby ones and the, and the, the, the uh, red ones are the, the new ones are growing. Of course, adulthood, look at that, they're, they're disappearing. They're disappearing in adulthood, you're growing a few. And finally, you get to the point where uh, you're, you know, they're dying off and, and uh, you know, there's a sign of aging here. And of course, you've got little ones trying to grow if these adults are learning new things. If adults learn new things, you're gonna have more growth in those. But if you're suffering from chronic stress, of course, uh, you're gonna have a lot of uh, issues and a lot of problems with, uh, with that. It's not good because dendritic spines, not only do they uh, suck up the, um, the, uh, the, the um, chemistry for uh, memory and, and learning, but they also provide you know, resilience and protection against Alzheimer's disease. The good thing is that you know, uh, when you think about trauma, you, if, you're, if, we're, if we're living in a world of trauma, that's not good. It's not good. Um, no matter how traumatic it is, it's not good to stay in there too long. You know, and it's really incumbent upon us to kind of help people move through that trauma. Because when the stress and the trauma is eliminated, or it's neutralized, or it's balanced, these dendritic spines will heal. Same thing with telomeres. Telomeres at the end of the chromosomes here, really important because they are, um, um, uh, they protect our, our genetic data, right? Inside we have the cells, uh, or the cancers and all the diseases and diabetes and those things that sort of live in our, in our, uh, in, in our, um, in our genes, right? And so as, as they shrink, you see the grandpa, the grandpa chromosome here, and his uh, telomeres are short. Well, what happens is that as they get shorter, you know, we are more uh, likely to get the diseases of aging. However, we know that from looking at hunter-gatherer populations and healthy aging populations, that they don't have to get very short. They can actually get longer by doing uh, healthy things like I've been talking about. Um, we, we know that from certain studies that, you know, um, people who exercise, like I said, they move, have good, high aerobic capacities and longer telomeres than people who are sedentary, meaning that longer telomeres means better health, longer uh, longevity, uh, and also uh, less disease that's gonna happen in, in their lives. Um, and, and as you exercise and as you move, uh, your telomere length could be similar to people that are, are much younger. Um, here's, the, here's the power of, of chronic stress though. Uh, chronic stress says that, you know, um, let's say even if you're healthy, uh, let's say you've got a depressed group and then with the study looked at and they looked at healthy participants both having chronic stress in their lives um, uh, many of them um, still had very short uh, telomeres right it's not good they should be nice and long so even working out and kind of lifting weights and running is cannot really balance out with chronic stress in your life after the hour that you spend in the gym or walking down the road you know, it's going to be, it's going to be overcome and, and um, it's going to be overshadowed by the chronic stress in your life, which is why we have that great ability to dance and to sing and to laugh and to uh, tell jokes and, and to uh, do things and hang out with people, right? These are things that are all protective factors that are going to increase the length of the telomeres. And of course, um, depressed people get higher levels of cortisol, uh, cortisol release regulation, meaning that fight flight is always on duty right and which of course then tells the body decay decay shorten those telomeres give me you know give me cancer or give me diabetes or give me a tumor or something the same thing about children we know that kids who are in stressful homes um, um, also um, uh, encode you know certain neurotransmitters in the brain that heighten the effect of the stress well the neurotransmitters are like you know, cortisol or sometimes um, they're like um, nor epinephrine, you know, which keeps me on alert all the time, right? Here's what we know too about children living in the most stressful environments. Shorter telomeres than those kids that live in the most loving and nurturing settings. So you can think about an indigenous community where there's a lot of stress and a lot of uh, violence um, and, and a lot of uncertainty. You take that community, you turn it back, you take the violence away and um, some of the stress away, and I, I, I can bet you that even with poverty, if people were, were um, happy together, gathering food together, creating their own food together, 
as long as you take away the, the uncertainty of violence and other things, poverty is not going to be a factor because indigenous people have always lived in that state where you know um, they didn't have to have a certain income to live in society. They had to have a certain access to the land so they could hunt and they could fish and they could gather. Right? That's that's what was the um, you know the, the the factor that they have now. As we sit and wait for uh, food to be delivered to us, or we eat these inferior foods, then of course it's going to not only make our, our, our health bad and give us diabetes and obesity, it's going to shorten our telomeres because again, the body's saying decay, right? Uh, something to uh, remember and to recognize is that telomeres, just like epigenetic um, uh, material, can be passed down generations. And this really certainly happened to me when I did my 23andMe. DNA analysis, and then I had it further analyzed because I, I study this stuff and I look at it and uh, include it in my work. Uh, my mother had many shorter telomeres. Why? Because my mother, you know, at one point she, she was very thin. Uh, she just died in February at age 94, uh, but she wasn't a healthy 94. She, her, her body, her brain was, but her body wasn't very healthy because she had diabetes for many years. Um, but she was exposed to a number of life factors, you know. Um, in, um, um, you know, she was an innocent child who was exposed to a lot of violence, you know, from, um, from uh, her father, my grandfather, and his, uh, he was a chronic uh, alcoholic, very violent alcoholic, so life was very uncertain uh, for her. Poverty was nothing because people lived together. Um, um, they didn't have to live in big houses. Uh, you know, they all lived together under one roof. Many uh, families uh, shared uh, space. Uh, people were happy, but people were very busy. But um, she was exposed to a number of life factors. So uh, this happens today. Mothers who are sh exposed to, you know, factors that are, you know, fear, hate, uh, uncertainty, uh, trauma, uh, shortens their telomeres, and they pass those on to baby. So when baby's born, like I was born, I was born biologically older because I already had uh, shortened telomeres. So what do I do? I run a lot. I fast. I do all these things, and my telomeres um, are, are quite good right now. Had, uh, so anyway, let's go on here. Um, also, uh, depression is one of those things that can be passed on too. We understand that, you know, by looking at uh, some uh, some studies. Um, uh, one of the last things I'll talk about here is uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Let's see here. Um, yeah, let me talk about this here. Um, so, brain-derived neurotrophic factor I mentioned was the big darn native fella. So I just wanted to give you a picture of that. What is that? Well, it's the proteins that are produced in the brain. And these promote neuron growth. More brain cells. More brain cells, good, better. You, it can give you what's called cognitive reserve. You have more brain cells to draw from. And so when we look at uh, uh, slides or images of, of a, let's say, an elderly woman who um, has gotten dementia, but yet she's still talking and exercising and her mind is as good as ever, and you, and you look at her brain and say, wow, look at this brain. It's all full of you know, tangles and, and uh, amyloid proteins. And how was she able to think? But science now has kind of said, I, we think that she has developed a reserve of brain cells that can still be drawn from, from memories, learning how to do things, uh, um, and uh, functioning, right? So it's like your, your brain will always be able to kind of be resilient if you continue to give it the material it needs to continue to grow um, uh, more brain cells. And it stops the neurons uh, uh, that you have from dying. This particular study showed that the, uh, this big uh, aggressive white mouse bullying this little small mouse uh, created all the stress for this brown mouse. And one of the things that happened, as I said, is the brain-derived neurotrophic factor increased in the brain, which was a good thing because you don't, the little brown mouse, we don't want his brain to die. Or we want his brain to, to live. Uh, but also what happens is that it activates genes in the front part of the brain that produce higher levels of all these uh, different emotional disorders like social anxiety, withdrawal, and depression. So the idea then is that these studies that we've seen like this um, suggest that the BDNF in, in the part of the brain here, um, and it's signaling you know, throughout the body then, uh, also creates this pathophysiology within the body and within the brain of, of depression and even suicidal behavior. So now we have an idea of where suicidal behavior comes from. It's not just like people think about it, but if there's signaling going on with may, maybe a BDNF in the brain, so maybe someone just doesn't have enough BDF in the brain that's, that's you know, although, say, well, they had a great life, there was nothing wrong, right? 
But we don't know until unless we take a look inside the brain to kind of say, how's that BDNF functioning? Is there enough in that brain, right? Or is it overloading? You know, is there too much stimulation? And I think that's kind of what's happening, you know, in, in the future. So um, just the last couple slides here. What we know, practice with mindfulness increases the brain uh, white matter. Uh, this is my second youngest daughter meditating. Uh, more practice is better, changes uh, gray matter, which is associated with memory, sense of self, empathy, and stress, and it actually improves the brain. And a lot of practice increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We also know that um, it affects uh, parts of the brain called the conflict-related insula, or just the insula. I call it conflict-related because it's, it's how, um, how the body then uh, is able to control mental emotions and regulation of the body's homeostasis. But also, think about that. When you're doing meditation, like my girl is doing here, It also, um, um, let's see, no, I'm sorry. It also uh, helps us uh, control our negative emotions. So everything I've talked about has all been in the formula, right? All the stuff uh, that I've talked about so far. Um, same thing here. Uh, it, it activates this uh, TPJ, this temporal parietal junction here. You see this, all this connection going on. Well, here's the TPJ that sort of sets things into motion. And of course, we have this talk going on in the brain all the way back to the seeing part of the brain. Um, we know that it increases emotional intelligence, right? So that we're able to see, you know, the, the condition that people are in. And I, I, I theorize that our elders spent so much time in the contemplative world that their emotional intelligence went beyond human beings. That they could, they could uh, measure the emotion. They could measure the emotions of animals, you know, uh, dogs and horses and animals, you know, and birds, and maybe even the emotions of trees and grass or those kinds of things which I think, you know, um, some people can do, right? There's this kind of uh, connection that we make. So let me just end with those last couple of slides here. This is um, neurodecolonization, and this is one of my fellow tribesmen uh, meditating in the Earth Lodge many, uh, back in about 1903 on these pipes. And of course, uh, what's happening to his brain here during baseline before he starts the meditation is the prefrontal cortex, left prefrontal cortex, occipital lobe, seeing part of the brain. As he gets deep into the meditation, looking at the pipes, we see a connection in the pre left prefrontal cortex, and, and it activates even stronger. We know now from uh, Western science that what lives in this part of the brain is happiness, joy, optimism, feelings of well-being, right? We see that the back of the brain too, that there's an activation here in the occipital lobe, the seeing part of the brain, where he's actually seeing beyond the pipes. He may be seeing the relatives that gave these pipes, the songs that were sung. He may be seeing, you know, where they were gathered, the tobacco that was laid down or whatever was happening. And this is why ceremony was so powerful, indigenous people, right? It's, they weren't just doing the ceremony because, because it was a good thing to do or because it was sacred or whatever. It was actually increasing activation, in very critical parts of the brain. Last slide here I'll show is this, uh, these uh, men here from my tribe uh, singing to a cedar tree. And they're singing to the cedar tree like the cedar tree is the mother. And as they sing to the cedar tree, of course, you know, it then increases their um, telomere length. But also, it, it silences a part of the brain called the parietal lobe. And that's really important because the parietal lobe is a part of the brain that's associated with um, spatial reasoning, right? And, and uh, this, uh, like, uh, the space between me and, and, and that tree, right? For example, if I was standing behind them, watching these men do the ceremony, and they were doing, they were singing to this tree and talking to this tree for hours and hours and days and weeks and months, which they did, which they did. This part of the brain goes quiet and that visual spatial reasoning part of the brain says, guess what? No more distance exists between these singers doing the ceremony in that tree. Bam, they connect. They become the tree. The tree becomes them. We now know how that works how it happen, happens with great you know, people that, that do this for long periods of time. They become the essence of the tree, the fragrance, the leaves, the bark, the roots, and, and the very essence of the tree, the tree becomes alive to them, right? So now we know a bit about how our ancestors did these kinds of things and why they did these kinds of things and what it did. So uh, I'm just gonna end there because I know I'm out of time and uh, just see if there's questions. Many thanks to you, uh, Dr. Yellowbird, Lasso Kamati. Um, 
I really, I'm really glad that you, you, you ended there because I feel like, you know, so much of what you've been sharing with us kind of comes down to this, I think, fundamental, this fundamental notion that, you know, our ceremony is medicine and, and, and being able to understand that, that power, not, you know, uh, avoiding the hazards of going through the motion and, and, and staying sort of confined to a, uh, um, you know, a static interpretation of, 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 of tradition rather than an active kind of um, animation is, is the key to, uh, to, to, our, uh, to our reclamation, to our, to our healing. I, I think one of the most powerful things that, that you shared that I think I'd like to ask you a question. We have a couple of questions that, um, that, have, that have come in, but uh, one of the first things I'd like to ask you, you know, I think one of the more powerful things that you shared, you know, to run, to move, to sing, uh, to, to dance, um, these were efforts that were colonized. They were some of the first things that were tried to be silenced, um, not the least of which was through um, the, 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 the policies and the, act, and, and the actions of the, 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 the Indian boarding schools. Um, and, and I think they knew that, that, that there was strong, profound medicine there, which was one of the reasons why that was, was, uh, was activated. Or, or was targeted. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how the awareness that the practices that that we have, you know, the traditional or indigenous cultures and 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 um, um, uh, our medicines are not only food for the spirit, right, of of, of the of the heart, of the soul, uh, the body, the mind, but how they're active modes of of neurodecolonization. Can you, I guess, offer some feedback to those that are actively involved in cultivating spaces? of, of uh, reclaiming, of, 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 of amplifying indigenous culture and language uh, to take one's practice to, you know, a level of liberation, of, 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 of wellness, of, of, of whole being. Um, you did kind of mention that culture and language programs are important, but if they stay kind of just dichotomized as we do this because it's tradition, how, how can we best go about a way of taking it to the level of um, of liberation, of, of, of true embodiment? Yeah. So uh, thanks, Sam. It was a good question. Um, um, it, it's about a journey, right? It's really about a journey. So the metaphor I have in my mind is, is that all of us take a journey. We go on a journey. It's our language journey, our healing journey, our uh, you know, our uh, get in shape, you know, physically journey, or, or you know, it's a journey of, uh, you know, searching out trauma. But before we go on the journey, we have to prepare. We have to be strong on that journey and that, and that you know, and, and one of the things that gives us the strength, the resilience on the journey, I think is, uh, is the contemplative practices. That's the first piece, right? Is, uh, as I said earlier, decolonization begins in the mind first. A decision, you know, we're conscious, right? Uh, we have some, we have most of the agency or the most of the capacity to make that decision. Some of it's kind of, you know, influenced by our genetics. Some of it's influenced by foods we eat or sometimes influenced by our family. But we have, you know, within our power, the power of the mind to, to, to make choices, right? Any journey, if you're going to, if you're going to go across the desert, right? You know what the desert's like, you're not going to go without water, right? You're going to take a lot of water with you. And what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to drink some water every so often, but you're going to be sparing about that. And it, it, there's no time. There's no time for emotions. There's no time for self doubt or you know those kinds of things. Plan your trip. And I think that's really what it's all about. So how do you plan your trip? Well, just like that, that slide was showing about cognitive resilience, it's training. You train yourself, or you you sort of do the training under someone who. Uh, can kind of guide you through that kind of thing, right? If someone has got some tool that, you know, and says, well, you know, the only thing that you need is, is the sweat lodge. Well, that's, that's cool, you know? But I think to me, I need more than a sweat lodge, you know? I mean, it's a holistic system, right? If you want, if, you know, and, and that's, that's the whole thing about it, I think, is to understand that that is a journey, you know? Or if they say, well, you just got to fast, that, and that'll take care of it. It doesn't do that, you know? It's like a holistic journey. Uh, there are all these uh, systems that have to work. so. Anyone who is in those spaces of um, trying to uh, um, to uh, seek change, I think, has to kind of do it in a holistic way. I mean, it's very hard to you know to drive a car. On, you know, you can have three great tires, 
but your fourth tire, you know, if, if it's flat or if it's non-existent, you know, it's going to be a rough trip. So that's why the medicine wheel is used. The medicine wheel kind of contains all these different aspects of it. So, I mean, our, our ancestors were brilliant. They were genius you know, in, in, in the way they lived their lives. So they left, they left that kind of legacy for us. Nothing I talked about tonight is, you know, any, and it should be anything new to anybody, but it's framed in a different way. So, so that's why I look at the medicine room, medicine room that way, because it is, it's kind of the Rosetta Stone, as they call it. It's the, it's, it's there for us, you know, if we want to draw from it. So. Thank you for that. I, lo I love that, the, that, that response and that connection to the medicine wheel, of course, resembling balance and, and, and you know, not, not 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 focusing on just the three wheels. You need the you need all you need all four to be able to have that balance. And um, I appreciated your how your discussion went into sort of this uh, the notion of convergence, right? The moral and spiritual convergence, sharing you know, showing and demonstrating how so many cultures have have come to you know some some almost universal uh, you know rev revelations in a, in a sense, and how these how these uh, these truths have kind of been emergent over time um at least with regard to spiritual offerings you know the emphasis of colors and, and and ceremonies that we might see from from uh you know group to group um those many demonstrations that represent fundamental relationship relationality i think are is very powerful um a, a, as you know so actually a variety of spiritual traditions though have been co-opted for empire and imperialism and you know, I'm thinking, of course, Christianity as it as it resembled on the United States, even Buddhism in some in some instances of history. Um, I'm 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 curious as as to how we might disentangle, you know, the consequences of colonialism from some of those central tenets of of moral and spiritual. Um, I wouldn't call it purity, but I guess a practice, you know, a centering practice. Um, so I guess even better, perhaps, what 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 would you uh, it what kind of I guess what advice would you give to those seeking to strengthen their practice, even if there are some elements of that history which can be very complicated, right? With the weight and the knowledge of of, of empire and, and colonialism, uh, some yeah. things can't be unknown, right? When you know about the history, how do we right. how do we uh, grapple with that? Well, I think you know one of the things I try to show is that a lot of the the, the practices um, and, and the science that I showed, and then the historical, I mean, the indigenous knowledge and science they showed, is universal. You know, I mean, it's, it gets back to we're all related. You know, we're all one people, uh, and and that's what people have done. I mean, we can be you know imperialistic, or we can be um, genocidal in our in our ways and our thinking and in our activity, but. You know, I mean, it's it's the idea that humans are humans in terms at, at a very you know clear biological level uh, is, is is very true, right? In most cases, there are differences. You know, when mutations happen with populations around the world, so some folks may become more you know um, different in, in whatever way, you know, physical, spiritual, emotional, um, you know, whatever it is. But I think that's the thing is that you know human beings uh, essentially. Everything I've talked about, you know, is you're going to find that, you know, um, within the uh, genetic profile and then with the cultural profiles of people. But that just, you know, it's so the, what we're talking about right now, the changes, um, uh, you know, have only happened about 12,000 years ago where, you know, uh, uh, agriculture and industrialization happened a bit later uh, and those kinds of things. Other than that, you know, most. Most groups at that period, 12,000 years ago, were hunter-gatherer populations around the world. You know, they weren't farmers. They weren't. They didn't live in you know these huge metropolitan, cosmopolitan you know uh, mega cities. You know that that happened later when people were doing those kinds of things. So um, I, I think you know that's that's the really important thing to remember is that if you put it in context, you know, just like people say that you know we are all related at some level. So we just have to figure out really sort of what. What that means in our own journey, right? And drawing from things and borrowing from things uh, is going to primarily do the same thing. If I sat next to a, a settler in a, in a hot sweat lodge that was really hot, you know, he's going to have the same physiological response. His, his spiritual response may be somewhat different, but after uh, she or he learns, you know, what that is, then of course that could change over, you know, within a generation. Uh, will it change uh, genetically? Probably not, but you know, it'll change at some point. 
so we're always in this constant state of, of uh, you know, change, you know, so from, from one moment to the next and one millennia to the next. So. I appreciate that. Yeah. So it sounds like there's, uh, you know, sometimes the the intense cognitive work can often get in the way and, you know, understanding some of those 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 those, those uh, central truths and realizations of relationship, relationality are, are, are really important. Um, I have a there's a question uh, from uh, from the, the, the group chat here that uh, that states, I'm curious what Dr. Yellowbird's perspective would be on indigenous folks who have eating disorders, who over exercise, under eat or get sick from an attempt to practice the amount of movement our ancestors may have participated in. So again, you know, a discussion about about balance and, and you know, definite struggles that, that some folks deal with. Um, um, what, what is your perspective on on that? Well, I think, you know, um, we're just learning a lot of those uh, those things now. One of the slides I had um, earlier, I didn't didn't get a chance to talk about it because I knew I was going to have a lot of material tonight. But it was called um, it's it, you know what we're talking about is um, um, called mismatch a mismatch hypothesis that you know some of us are mismatched you know for the world that we live in, and that can include eating disorders whether it's um, eating too much or too little. Some people say, well, you've got an eating disorder because you're um, Grerilin, uh, which is, you know, um, says eat, 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 you know, is not working well, right? Well, it could be, um, that's true, you know, in today's society, but the ghrelin, which is a hormone that says eat, was probably damn important, you know, 10,000 years ago when, when it says, you know, uh, I don't like to taste this food, right? I don't want to eat my um, asparagus, I don't want to eat my broccoli or whatever it is, or back in that day, I don't want to eat these wild cherries that are bitter as hell, right? But if you ate them because the ghrelin says eat them, guess what? You're going to survive. So now we have eating disorders because we are we are we live in a world where we're not matched for that world right now. So that's the evolutionary theory behind it. The genetic theory behind it is that we've inherited you know genes then uh, that were that also uh, signal to our bodies right to eat or to uh, not eat or um, to put on weight. Or we have other genes, um, I'm not remembering all the names of the genes right now, that you know, when we sit like me, I have to move a lot, I have to run a lot, and I have to move quite a bit more than most people because when I sit, I don't burn as many calories sitting still. I, got, I inherited my mom's gene there. So um, you know, I'll, I'll put on more weight in, in a year's time if I don't move, if I don't fast, those kinds of things. So it's, I think some of those disorders um, could be uh, framed in another way that you know, that they worked in another context. For example, um, just a real quick example, um, there's, there's a, 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 a disease called hematomacrosis, which is the high uh, buildup of iron in the blood. That can be deadly now for us, you know. Uh, if you, uh, so you get your blood checked and you find out, you know, your iron is high or it's low or whatever, but some people are, are uh, build up iron and they store the iron in their body. I don't, I'm not one of those people, although I've got a gene for that. My, my iron is always great. However, if you were to look at your ancestors, and again, don't think of yourself as just as an indigenous person. Think of yourself as having ancestors all around the world at some point that came from Ireland, that came from Africa, that came from Asia, that came from uh, the Arctic Circle or whatever. Those markers are in the, are in the human body. They're in the human race, right? Um, and we're learning more and more about that. So somebody who could end up, let's say, in uh, Seattle, Washington, who one day discovers, you know, a big swelling on their hand, and they go to the doctor, and the doctor looks at it and examines it, checks their blood, and says, well, you've got hematomacrosis. I don't understand how you have that, right? So this person could be an indigenous person, right? So I don't understand how you did that. That's a disease of Nordic communities. What do you mean? Well, Nordic communities way back in the when, way back in the day, you know, I don't know how many, you know, 20,000 years ago, had a particular kind of genetic variant where that stored more iron in the blood. Why was that important? Because iron in the blood would pre prevent uh, crystallization of the blood where the blood would freeze and cause death. So iron prevented that. That came from that time to here and now where it'll kill us. So it served a purpose back then. We just have to, we're just kind of, you know, as you say, disentangling those things and that knowledge to know what it is. So it's very, you have to be very careful about prescriptions or when people tell you, 
that this is a disorder and this is a problem, whatever it is, um, you have to look at it in terms of a historical context where you may have carried that from an ancestor that kept them alive and you're here because of that today. So it's, you know, uh, we have to think about it, you know, reframe it in that, that sort of way. So, um, so what do you do about things like that? I think to me, uh, what I've done is I have examined um, my family history, of course, but I've also examined um, you know, uh, my genetic profile to look at those things and learn as much as I can. So, you know, and, and that's been really valuable knowledge to me, so. Thank you for that for that response, Las Comati, and thank you for this entire two hours plus now that we've been able to spend together. Um, I I think you know fundamentally what is so remarkable about uh, about what you have shared with us is is really the blending of knowledges right from the the what we have known for for ages and and how Western science in in some ways is is, is starting to catch up with what we have known and being able to demonstrate some of these these uh these observations these outcomes that we have we, that we have seen i think the challenge is as we are you know in engaged with a uh, a highly westernized world we have to in some ways re-remember right some of these things that we have been doing for generations to run to sing to dance to be in ceremony these are the you know some of the purest antidotes um, especially in a world where the medical industry, all these industries, the industrialization of of, of sickness, of you know, uh, of depression, um, we we have in some ways what what we need right right here inside of us. So so thank you for explaining sort of these connections, uh, being able to support one another in these ways. Of course, as we know the um with as as heavy as some of the recent news has been these are really good reminders that uh in order to to be able to uh take care of oneself uh sometimes we just we we have to re-remember and um and and to to ground ourselves in in those ways that we we've always known so so again thank you very much for for sharing all that with us um, we in, invite everyone that was uh, that's on the call that has been you know that has gone the distance with us today to continue to uh, to reach out to us to to continue learning. Um, follow us on our all of our uh, social media accounts, YouTube videos. Um, sign up for E News, become a member. It's free. We have so many free resources that we are just aching to get into your hands and uh, you know continue uh, following along with us. Join us in this movement. Um, as we as we continue to um, you know expand the coalition and push towards greater truth uh, ad, uh, advocacy and and healing. So uh, with that, we wish everyone uh, a good evening, and we will uh, see you all on the next webinar. And you know, um, hopefully in future gatherings when we're all able to kind of reconvene again. So uh, thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Timoitaske. Thank you very much, Dr. Yellowbird. We'll see you again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, bye-bye, everyone.